think we have already one. is 95% water. So if you plant a field of a thousand, uh, what we call palmas, né? each one 95% water and they weigh about one kilo each, you have actually literally planted 950 liters of water. <coughs> okay? Next year you'll have three times that. Okay? So we literally plant water. Okay? All these plants are succulents and they conserve water and they create microclimates which I'm working with around, <coughs> around them. The sisal is absolutely fabulous for creating soil. Uh, you can plant the sisal four or five years in this white sand, you have beautiful brown garden soil. So we use these plants to s conserve water <coughs> and to create soil. And this is the structure of our, our, our farm. And we plant everything else among them. So we have this field with these four elements. And then we use this structure to do the rest. Okay, another strategy that we use a lot, uh, oh, 10 minutes, sorry, okay, is to, to use a lot of wood, especially <coughs> buried wood, this thanks to Seth Holzer, but it gives tremendously good results. We do our garden beds, and we use a lot of native plants. Uh, Jurubebe is a soil nasa that we use to make compost, okay? The region has a lot of coconut trees because we have a lot of water, and we use a lot of homemade bone meal, which absolutely made the difference for us because this is phosphorus and calcium in uh, balanced. So we go around and you know, the animals who died, we say, oh, <laughs> Fulano's, uh, um, Elvis's, we have many neighbors called Elvis. Elvis's <laughs> horse died, oh, what a pity. Where did they throw it? <laughs> <laughs> Elvis's horse should just right. And then we go and, and we take these bones and we burn them and, and we use them in everything. It's been, this is really when the land began to evolve. It was actually David Holmgren who, who taught us to do this. He visited us uh, five years ago. And, and another strategy for dry land, absolutely necessary to use animals. It's really, really difficult not to. Why? Because seven months of the year, you don't have decomposition. It's no use putting mulch because it doesn't become uh, compost. It just dries it up and blows away, it oxidizes. This is the people of uh, holistic management are very strong about this. So it's very important for us to make compost, it's something we never did in rains, rainforests. You never have to make compost in rainforests. You just pile it on the land and that's it. But this animal stomach, which does the job of decomposing, okay? So, so we make compost, we use the chickens to make compost, but we also use the animals to uh, decompose, decompose organic matter and to increase fertility. The pigs have been fantastic <coughs> because the soil is so poor, and they eat a lot and they, they shit a lot <laughs> and they bury everything. 
so when we're going to plant um, corn or we or we put in the pigs and then we take out the pigs and we hoe it a little bit and then we plant the corn and it always gives very good results. So animals for us, in my opinion, this I little by little I got there because I was a militant vegetarian for 10 years. <laughs> uh, we, little by little we came to the realization that dry land systems really can benefit from the use of animals as part of the system. We have other animals as well. <laughs> this is Gerald of the goose who's who is our supervisor, who makes sure that everybody behaves themselves, and if they don't, you get bit. You get <laughs> and we have enormous quantity of little monkeys who are always stealing our bananas. And, and so we, we actually have a very, it's almost like a, a petting zoo. You know? we, we use a lot of animals, okay? Shout out for president. <laughs> As an ins inside joke. Anybody here been to Marizal already? <laughs> you, you know about Judal. <laughs> He's very famous. Okay. Okay, we do all these things that everybody does to keep the water on the land. We, all the roofs have cisterns on them. We have very beautiful uh, cisterns in the form of pots because of Victor Schauberg says, you know, the water is, stays in movement. It's really, our, we have a very talented builder because I think he never went to school. So he actually is able to visualize things in three dimensions. You know, he doesn't have a linear uh, visualization, okay? So we use all this, the strategies that everybody uses, cisterns, swales, and trenches, windbreaks, shade trees, seconds, no-till when possible, barriers. We don't, I don't make many um, swales per se. I, I use more barriers with vegetation because our land is so porous, it's so easy to infiltrate, and I don't, we don't have small scale machines. We only have very big machines these to work the right. So really to go into the land to make uh, swales with machines. I don't trust them. I don't think they, they know well enough. I was afraid to make a disaster. So we use vegetation and barriers and fertility. And there it is. There. This is for our drinking water. Now, our systems for drinking water all have this form of of um, <laughs> clay pot. <laughs> it's made of bricks. And then the others we do a uh, simpler form. Wow. This is for the well, the water, we use the well water pot for washing and for, not for taking baths, washing dishes, etc. So the pump from the well goes to this and from here it's distributed to the whole property. We have water in every point of the property. We've been there for 12 years, so <laughs> did that. Okay. And we have a, a little dry creek where it sometimes runs in fairly abundant water, but since we've made this barrier, and I'm not sure, I hope it's going to hold, <laughs> it, it, we have never had the, rain, the water running again. So let's see if it works. The idea not, is not to make a lake, but just to back up the water so that it will infiltrate more. About one kilometer from here, this water falls into the river and it's gone is lost to the land. So we're trying to keep the water on the land as long as possible. We've been very successful with this idea of planting things in trenches, not exactly a swale, but in trenches. The pumpkins, the squash, I particularly loved it. And we're, we're beginning to, to do it all over the property because it's been very successful. <coughs> These are the barriers I told you about. We use sisal, wood, grass, and then Avelois, um, mm -hmm. And th This is actually the goat's pasture. We raise uh, milk goats. Okay, the cactuses are perhaps the, uh, this is, I think I'll, I'll end my speech on, on this idea. The cactuses are really the most important element of our system because they are so multi-use. First of all, it's a very important commercial crop. In the dry season, you can get a very good uh, price for them. So I consider that we're actually cactus planters, okay? <coughs> we use them for the dry season, for the animal food. We use it for ourselves. We eat it a lot, it's delicious. It's very rich in calcium and zinc. That's why they use it to cure diabetes. Mm because diabetes is a zinc, zinc and chrome deficiency. Right? Um, 
and it, it really creates very good microclimates, okay? And the fact that it's 95% water. So we literally have planted the whole farm with cactuses. And all the combinations possible, yeah? Yeah, I started out the very first year, the first thing I did was to plant, I spent a fortune planting cactuses. And these, these are not native, these are from Luther Burbank, you know, the ones that don't have thorns, yeah? mm -hmm. The native ones have, have a lot of thorns. I planted the whole property practically with cactuses, but they died because the cactus needs a certain minimum of minerals to, to survive, yeah? mm -hmm. So now they're, they're doing well. Now the soil has evolved enough that we can actually plant them wherever we want. We use them as windbreaks. Didn't work. Uh, now, when when we this is a, a cornfield, and we insert cactuses in the fields. For example, when we co plant corn or cassava, we always plant cactuses because we always are concerned what will happen when the corn is cut leaves. No? Uh, We've worked with polycultures. Uh, actually, I was the founder of, a, of polyculture. I see, I invented a polyculture project for the Proculture Institute, which worked with a thousand farmer families. Right? I didn't work with it because by then I was off doing all my, my own thing. And we do work with polyculture, but for corn, we discovered that the, the best thing for corn is we plant it in blocks. <coughs> and <coughs> when the corn is almost, when you uh, hoe it the first time, we plant cactuses and we plant um, pasture. Because in the drylands, the, the grasses, the grasses, the perennial grasses are what create soil, okay? In the rainy regions, it's the forest that creates soil, okay? So this is something that I, I discovered a few years into this project. Yeah? So this is a native cactus, relative of the saguaro, yeah? So there, here, here is a good example. This is cowpea field. And you can see the cactuses. You can see the, the uh, fushiku, the euphorbiasa. And you can see here a coconut tree. And, and this is the way we always plant. We always plant very complex fields, but not polycultures <coughs> necessarily. We use the polycultures, the structure of the field, which gives the poly polyculture. A few, few fodder trees as well. Right? And it's just about time up. OK. So the last thing I want to say, okay. the last strategy yeah, I want sorry to say, to be, so. be patient with yourselves. It takes time. It really does take time. Yeah? Bill Mollison, my colleague who did the course with Bill Mollison with me in, in Brazil many years ago, he said that Bill Mollison is an illusionist. And that's true. I think there's a lot of sort of illusionism going around in permaculture. Yeah? <laughs> you make the design and ah, that's it. But it really does take years and years of learning to, to what works for you. So um, that's it. Um, I just like to give a shout out to my wonderful team who is like a family to me. These people have been with me for eight years. And our co contact, if anybody would like to have contact with us. Thank you, okay. Asha, for that really, really inspi <coughs> inspiring talk. Please stay up here for some questions. Oh, right. I'm, I forgot. I know there's one already. Um, but, no, just to see how you can turn the desert into a paradise like that yes. has inspired me. Yeah. Yeah. There was a question uh, from the look, gentleman looks, here. Looks wonderful. Thank you. What predators do you have and pests, and how do you deal with them? Stop somebody else eating your lunch. Wait, actually, we don't, we don't have much... We have some raccoon-like animals that sometimes eat, steal the eggs or the chickens, but we don't have much predator problems. No. Yeah. The worst predator problem we have is with our sheep and goats is packs of dogs. When there's a ditch in heat, <laughs> that's really dangerous. They can kill eight or nine sheep in one night. Yeah. And sheep die silently. So we've discovered that the goats protect the sheep because uh -huh. the goats will attack the dogs and the sheep just run until they die. We actually don't have much problem with prey. We don't have much problem with insects. Really, dry dry climates are really good for this. You know, you don't have many mosquitoes. We do have one very serious endemic disease that's transmitted by dogs, which can be fatal. 
and my my long most long term employee actually had it almost died of it. So we don't keep dogs. No, no. We actually don't have much fun. Just a very quick one. What, what's the ambient temperature in the morning? Oh, um, when it gets really, really, really cold, it's 17 degrees centigrade. <laughs> <laughs> and top is about 38 in the shade. And that's very common. Very common. We can have weeks of it. You know, it can be very hot in the, in the summer. But the land, as we have a lot of trees now, much more shade is becoming increasingly comfortable. But it can be very hot in the summer. Gentlemen, it's yeah. such a dry land area with uh, grasses. How do you deal with fire? What kind of fire break is strategy? Well, actually, we we don't have problem with fire yeah. in our region. I, in the Serra <laughs> in the the savanna region, this is a tremendous problem. Yeah. Um, and we have uh, we have a neighbor who prays, and when he prays, the fire goes out. No. So, the only fire we've had in the 12 years there was because the fire was so remote that he didn't know about it. But as soon as he found out about it, he blessed it and it went out. <laughs> I was just thinking with the amount of water you've got sitting in the cactus, yeah. that's sort of fire retardant anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that was yeah. a It Actually, no, we did have a fire this year. Um, Sebastian heard... Um, heard uh, a goat in, in distress, he went running, and she was strangling herself in her, the house, and so he, took, he didn't have a, he couldn't leave her to get a, a knife, he didn't have a knife, we had some matches. So he burnt the cord, and then he took her and, but he didn't notice that the match fell into the bedding, a very deep story. And we burnt the whole goat house, and the, the fire went over the field, began to take over the fields in the heart of the dry season. And I was there with just little sandals, you know, stamping it out. But it was very easy. The very, it's not a very flammable system there. Thank heavens. Thank it's not flammable. And it's very small. Okay. Oh, no, 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 there's time for more questions. Any more questions? Okay, man in the back, and then you. If you're storing so much of the water in plants, how are you cycling the water? The plants cycle the water through the system. Uh, actually, we use sometimes. Yeah, sometimes we use the cactus um, in a planting hole for for trees as a, a source of irrigation. We actually use the cactus as a source of irrigation as well, right? and it works quite well. But we have other water circling through the system. We have the water from the well, which all our water is recycled, and, eh, and the rainwater is always off the roof. And we have a lot of water circling through the system. Eh? All, all the water that leaves the house is a, 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 an irrigation system. Eh? All the water. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, you said that you cultivated the cactus and you sell it and it's high in the calcium and zinc. How, how do you sell that? Oh, we sell it to farmers for animal food. But do you just cut it then? Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's fabulous. Yeah. You just cut it off and put it in the... How do you say hiboko? How do you say hiboko? Hiboko. Uh, you, ah, the animal? Trop. Trop. Yeah, you yeah. put... No, you, yeah. Main you just put it on the back of uh, the trailer. You put it on the trailer. The pickup. And you trailer. put it in the trailer oh, and you sell it. Yeah. And it has a very high market value. So we've never sold it because we have our own animals, et cetera. But if we wanted to, it would be a really important source of income for us. The animals give a good source of income. So we have very high quality meat, Sorry, very high quality. Just to clarify, you're actually chopping the opuntia itself, not just the fruit, not just uh, the fruit. It almost never uh, grows long enough to give the fruit, yeah. because we're always using it. Now, because it, to give the fruit needs about four years, I think. So we almost never use the fruit. And the people that don't even know it's edible. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so you said that um, most of the time you can use compost for this. Well, that's the result of no, um, no decomposition. Decomposition. Thank you. So how do you deal with that topic? I mean, if you have compost toilets. Yes. Oh, uh, we have a very intelligent composting toilet. <laughs> it's a little house that you carry around the field. <laughs> <laughs> we make a hole and then we put the, the we put the soil back, yeah? And then we plant something. 
I mean, take off the house and plant something. <laughs> you can do that when you have three to 20 meters of pure sand, you know? There's no danger contaminating the, the, um, not so fragile, the, uh, the water table. No? Yeah. The, the first um, water vein is 11 meters down. So it's actually a, 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 a filtering system in itself. No? You couldn't do that if it were heavy clay soil, which can become saturated. I call it, our soil has never become saturated. How many years before you made it a viable business? If you want a viable business, you wouldn't try to plant on seven hectares of pure sand. <laughs> <laughs> our viable business, it is a viable business. <laughs> but um, the, our viable business actually is the visitors, the trainees, the courses. It attracts enormous quantity of visitors. People are really curious to mm -hmm. see this. I bet. This paradise on um, pure white sand, you know? And actually, I have a certain fame as being the founder of the first permaculture institute in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So permaculture has really taken off in Brazil. Five years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, in 2005, I came to the Scandinavian Permaculture Conference. It was the last conference I participated in. When I was the only speaker uh, from Brazil, I was the only participant from Brazil, where I showed this great map of Brazil and I talked about the potential that Brazil has for permaculture. Now, just the permaculture social network has 6,500 people, and I don't know how many teachers there are out there. You know, they're all, we're all into the third generation. There are lots of permaculture courses going on, lots of little uh, communities springing up, and Lots of urban gardening. So permaculture is a big thing in Brazil now. Don't you think? You're yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a big thing in Brazil now. And as I was founder of the first permaculture institute, my name is more or less known in the permaculture network. So that attracts a lot of visitors. It's a certain mythology yes. which worries me a bit, you know, because I'm not sure I'm up to it. <laughs> I took the expectations. But the place is magical. It really is magical. It has an energy vortex of its own which is not the place, that's why I bought it. I didn't know it at the time, but that's why I was attracted to this place. And so it's really magical. It has a very magical feeling. It is a paradise for people to go there. It's hard to explain. We have no background, background noise, and you really, we started with two kinds of birds, and now we have 60. So you wake up in the morning, it's an absolute symphony of birds. And for people who come from Sao Paulo, which is 20 million people, it is in collapse. Sao Paulo is collapsing. I think it will happen this year. Mm -hmm. They've run out of water. Sao Paulo has run out of water. Uh, 20 million. Well, sounds like there need to be yeah. many more paradises called Brazil. Exactly. Brazil. Exactly. In fact, like, we're we're preparing for the exodus because 40 percent of our families are in Sao Paulo. You know, if the family has 10 members, four of the 10 members are in Sao Paulo. So they'll be all coming back. We think. So we're mm -hmm. increasing production. Now. Thank you very okay. very much. I feel very honoured. <laughs>
Um, so big swings in temperature. Um, and so you have to work with that, but also a very dry, dry climate. And so my goal here today is to um, offer hope and to be to show us that we with through permaculture design and through our intellect and through using all the natural resources around us can actually have a build resilient systems right and resilient situations for us because we don't really know what's going to happen right in the in the near future with with climate you know in the next 50 100 years you know they say some places are going to be wetter some places going to be drier some places going to be colder you know, overall warmer, but that might in individually might be different, right? So we don't really know. So how do you prepare for not knowing, right? You're, you prepare by building resilient systems that are, that are mutually supportive and redundant, right? And that's what permaculture teaches. And so that's what we've been trying to work towards in, uh, in uh, New Mexico. So, so basically, in my area, this was this is the pattern, um, and the pattern of humankind in most of the world, right? Is that we can't really control um, drought, but we can actually have a big key in controlling desertification, right? So those are different things, like drought and desertification. Through all of our man-made processes, we're basically wringing the sponge of the earth, right? Is we're like wringing it out and then pasting over, you know, cementing over the sponge so all the water just runs away, right? So through all of these different practices, we've, we've been drying out the land, right? So in New Mexico, that's led to lots of wildfires through overcutting and then overgrazing like the last photo. And then now with, with not cutting as much and not thinning the forest, there's tons of fire load. And so there's been a lot of fires where we are, which creates hydrophobic soils, the water runs off, creates a lot of soil erosion. What little topsoil we have is, is running down to the rivers or onto the streets, which starts, you know, obviously um, more soil erosion. So sheet flow, which takes away the topsoil, which creates gullies. And this, this is a physical manifestation of wringing the sponge, right? This is, what it, this is what I meant by wringing the sponge. This is all of our water. Instead of soaking into the ground with, through the roots and the, the plants pulling the water down into the soil and, and transpiring it, it's just running off, right? So this is a river that was flowing year-round maybe 10 years ago. Now it's an ephemeral stream. Wow. So this is, this is a, a river outside of uh, the largest city in, in New Mexico. This is the mighty Santa Fe River, that wow. where I come from. So obviously we've choked it down, we've plated everything. We've allowed very little opportunity for the water to infiltrate, right? So it just flows through town and then it's gone. Instead of having a, a beautiful river, it's just a, an ephemeral stream that runs whenever there's a large rain, right? And these, these, this is all just by design, right? <laughs> We've, we've done this to it. You know, the river used to flow in three or four different sections all through downtown, you know, 80 years ago. Like, there's a major road in my hometown, in Santa Fe downtown, called Water Street. Well, it's called Water Street because part of the river used to run. That street was the river. <laughs> but we've paved over it, right, and then channeled it all into this section of river that, that it can, can't infiltrate. And this is more bad design practices, obviously, like paving everything, you know, and raising the planting areas, the water can't, is just going to evaporate, it's not able to get to the trees. And then we bring in chlorinated water that's been filtered and chlorinated to try to irrigate the trees, right? So again, more desertification practices. This is what we call zeroscape. <laughs> Instead of zeroscape, right? Let's just pave everything. That'll solve it all, right? Just cover everything, which, creates this, right? Why, why do we do this? Especially in dry climates, people still build this way. Most engineers and, and design experts, this is how they build, shed everything away, drain everything away, right? So in dry climates, we really have to reverse that thinking, right? 
And instead of raised beds, we need sunken beds. You know, bring that water from your neighbor's property onto your property, right? Think about, don't plant on mounds, plant in basins, right? So why not this? Like, which of those two slides, what's going to create abundance, mm. right? What's going to create redundant structures to help us grow food and have water, right? So why are we doing this? Why are we just thinking? It's very simple techniques of like diverting water where the plants are, catching it in tanks, the overflow list of thinking of useful overflows, bringing water from hard surfaces into planting areas that help shade our structure, reduce the temperature, increase um, transport, transport evap evaporation, <laughs> excuse me. And tanks can, do, tanks can be in many different shapes and forms, right? This tank could be a trellis, it could be a privacy screen, right? It could be put in a certain area to soak up a lot of heat, right? So we could grow plants that are maybe not quite suited for our, um, for our environment. So different types of tanks that we've installed. This, the last one is, is a plastic poly tank. This is a, a galvanized tank. Um, and then we know through permaculture design that we, you know, that water has a lot of energy, right? Stored capacity. So it has a lot of mass, which equals um, ability to absorb solar energy and then give it off at night. So we can, we can work with that in our designs as well. Oh, this didn't come out so well. This was, <laughs> this is actually a design of a 10,000 gallon, um, so what's that, 37,000 liter? system, water catchment system, which you can't really see what's happening. The tanks are down here. Um, but this actually, this system is both taking rainwater from the house, it's also taking passive water that falls on the site, and then we have what we call an acequia or an irrigation ditch that runs behind the house. So on wet years, um, there is irrigation ditches in some areas of, of my town. And so this system can actually bring in that water from the irrigation ditch and filter it and put it into the tanks for future use. So in New Mexico, we have two dry seasons. Mostly it's the dry spring and a dry fall. So if we can make it through, we have snow and rain in the winter a little bit, and then we use our tanks to bring us through the dry spring. And then in the summer, we get our summer rains that hopefully get us through our dry fall, right? So these strategies are trying to bridge those two gaps. So here's the installation of that, that system. These are, uh, um, this is that 37,000 liter system. And uh, these are uh, polyethylene tanks. Here's another, I'm not sure why the, it's, yeah, it must have been in the transfer. Some of this isn't coming through very well, but this is a design of a, of a 70,000 liter system. And, uh, these people, they had a well, their well went dry, and so they're relying solely on rainwater harvesting. For all their domestic use, their children, their, they have animals, they have goats, chickens, ducks, and so this is, you know, collecting from the, their barn and the house into this, uh, see this is a 20,000 gallon system, so it's, what's that, it's like uh, 72,000, 74,000 liters system. So here's some details, they didn't come through. Here's the installation of this system. So this is what we call an active system, is actively capturing the rainwater and holding it in tanks, right? So this is, this is one way to do this, but it is very high tech, it's very in, um, energy intensive, right? Requires pumps and electricity, things like that. So yeah, sorry, none of these are really coming through too well. This is just showing that we um, also you can do this on a real residential scale. So the others are more rural scale. This is more residential. Thinking about wh where the water comes off the roof, tanks, overflow, um, wick systems, what we call like a passive wick system. So having the overflow either go into a, a rain garden bed of the tank, tank overflow into a rain garden bed, or a wick system, so with like a perforated pipe with a porous material, and then you can plant right onto that. So actually storing it more into the soil. And then don't forget about, like here, these are gray water bays. So as Marcia was mentioning, like using all of the water from the house, right? Not just rainwater, but rethinking, using the soil to clean your gray water um, and provide more irrigation to the plants, right? 
So there's different types of water. Where rainwater is like very, very clean. It's distilled. It's basically, you know, distilled water falling from the sky, right? And as it falls through the sky, the our, the air around us is majority nitrogen. So it's actually picking up a little bit of nitrogen as it falls through the sky, which is a fertilizer for plants. Plants love rainwater much more than well water or other types of water, right? Well water is like mineralized or like fossilized water, right? It's very old. It's been in the ground a long time, has a lot of minerals. So that's a little bit harder often for plants to deal with than rainwater. So we've, we've worked in different areas around the world. This is Vietnam doing very simple systems. This is in Uganda and Africa doing um, ferro cement tanks. So this is like going from the very technical kind of uh, you know, pumps and systems like that to this is a gravity fed system um, with ferro cement, which is a very um, low technology, very, fairly easy to get the materials around the world, you know, wire and, and concrete. And uh, many people around the world know how to, how to work with concrete. So even though it is an energy intensive material, this tank is holding about 80,000 liters. And so and the walls are about uh, four centimeters, five centimeters, something like that thick, right? So you don't have to use a ton of cement. It is made of cement, but the, the way you build it, it can be, you can have a very efficient use of materials for a large, a large effect. So again, the, okay, we're talking about more of like, like active catchment, right? Tanks and all of that, but what, like my favorite tank for storing water is actually the soil, right? So I think Marcia, we've talked about this also. So like thinking about how, what type of soil do you have? If you have sandy soil, how can I incorporate more organic matter or possibly more clay to actually hold that water longer, right? Um, so working with the soil, knowing the soil, working with it, incorporating uh, organic matter through composting, through mulching. Here's we're building a hookah culture bed. This is, uh, this is working in Jamaica here. So building that organic matter. Um, here's the hookah culture bed being, about being ready to uh, be planted. So they're always, of course, thinking of mulch in dry climates mulch everywhere, even in wet climates is good, but especially in dry climates. Lots of mulch, right? Hold that, put the blanket down. And to think about it, it's like, okay, how do we sterilize water in many places of the world? Through ultraviolet, right? Well, the sun is also giving off ultraviolet. So bare soil, we're basically sterilizing the soil, right? It's under an ultraviolet light. In many places of the world, they can't filter water, they actually sterilize water with just leaving bottles of water in the sun for more than six hours, right, called SOTUS. So it's a way to sterilize water through ultraviolet. So if you're not mulching your soil, and if you don't have a ground cover on the soil, you're basically sterilizing your soil, right? And plus, you're losing all the water, right? So building, building that layer of mulch, increasing the organic matter in the soil, which will increase the soil life, Right, ninety-five percent of the life in the soil is in the top, like thirty centimeters. Right, so if we're sterilizing the very surface of that, we're not allowing, we're really inhibiting the amount of life that can be in the top soil. Right. So here's working through some water harvesting designs on a project in in Jamaica. This is other types of kind of pass what we call like passive harvesting so we have lots of those gullies that we saw in the first part of the, the presentation so how do we start to repair that right if we want to slow down the water infiltrate it then we can start planting ground covers and native plants right so this is the start of that process in a gully so just taking the local materials of some wood branches and building a check dam right out of branches and mulch then we start like harvesting the water, soaking it into the ground, and then harvesting all that topsoil. So all that topsoil that was rushing down before will be slowed down, captured there, the silt and topsoil, which creates a beneficial environment for planting native plants and productive plants. Okay. So here's another way everyone probably here, or most people have heard about swales, right? So this is um, a project where we went in and this, this neighbor, or this, these people here, this, this is a client of mine, 
the neighbor had about 20 hectares of land that was very erosive and very steep and it all flowed basically onto their property. And so even though we are in a dry land, when our rain comes, it comes hard and strong. So sometimes we'll get, you know, two or three centimeters in an hour, even though that might be only a tenth of what we get in a year, but we're going to get it all in one hour, one afternoon. And so this property, on average, was, was having about 10 million gallons draining on it. So that's whatever, 370, or 37 million <laughs> liters of, of water draining onto it every year from the neighbor, right? Even in a dry land situation. But the problem is it was running straight to a gully and cutting out all of their soil. They were losing trees. So how can we slow that water down, spread it out, infiltrate it, soak it into the ground, right? So that was this project. So here there was actually existing trees that we were working new swales through it through. Here's, here's after, like this is their vineyard part of their land, so putting swales around it and getting a ground cover growing. It's hard to see in these photos, but again, here's another swale here. Um, and then always thinking about your exit, your overflows. So whether it's a tank or a swale or whatever it is, having a beneficial use for your overflow water and a protected, protecting your soil with ground covers and rock mulch. Okay, so here's a project similar to the one, bef the pictures before, but after two or three years, right? So these are all local productive plants, whether um, fruits or nuts, or possibly pollinating plants, or uh, attracting plants for pollinators. Um, so this is an area that gets, here we get like about 30 centimeters a year, like I was mentioning, right? So you can, you, what I'm trying to offer is hope that you can create these type of systems even in very dry lands, right? So again, here's another swale system. So here's the low area of the swale, and this is after about four years being planted. So there's hackberries, there's mulberries, there's nanking cherries, there's all type, four types of currants, uh, many different productive plants. Um, and then different to a lot of places here, a lot of places in, very, in more wetland, wetter areas, you would typically have a raised bed for more for more drainage, and then your paths are lower. Well, in drylands, we, we reverse that, right? So we actually put the paths on the, the berms or the swales on top of the berms, and so and then planting along the edges. Because some plants, especially dryland plants, is they don't want to sit in water. So you can't plant them right in the bottom of the swale because they, plants that can go through drought don't want to be inundated with water and sitting in water. So you have to plant them on the edges so that they can still get the water but not be drowned if we get a big rain. Okay. How are we doing on time? We doing um, yeah, we're doing fine. Okay. Great. So again, here's another example um, of, of a tank just catching off a carport here and then irrigating a small little food forest and, and greenhouse here in New Mexico. So this is like apple tree and this is also, of course, planting, you know, a guild planted out and below it and then part of a guild, so apple with comfrey and yarrow being the dynamic accumulators and um, ground cover of clover or vetch, some kind of nitrogen fixer. So also thinking about, um, so not only, so anyway, your multiple use plants, obviously. So in permaculture, we're always thinking about guilds and how do the plants support each other, right? So here's another photo of that. That's one thing about permaculture gardens, it's pretty hard to take a picture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of drives my wife crazy. She likes like, you know, the English garden style. So, um, but here, you know, it's like everything's happening together. And so the picture is like kind of just a green mass with some flowers, right? <laughs> but I promise all of this is thought through and designed to be this way. <laughs> So again, here's more fruit trees with comfrey and ground covers and um, attracting. So a lot of the wild native sunflowers to, to bring in birds and then they bring us fertilizer and beauty. You can also use um, even water features, right? So this is a part of one, of one of the first houses I worked on in town 
where we had a, we only had room for a small water catchment tank, small too small for the system for the roof catchment. So that would overflow into a wetlands pond area that we could grow uh, water lettuce and lotus root and bamboo and things that were edible plus beautiful. Then that would overflow into a, a rain garden bed, right? So incorporating both landscape and um, functionality in, into the system. Again, this is more just rain rain gardens that were, uh, you know, gardens that are supported by rain and gray water, black water in this system. So in the dry lands, we have to really think about, okay, not only like catching the water and storing it, but also how to reuse it. How many times can we reuse the water, right? And like I mentioned before, like how can we use the soil to actually clean up the water, right? So typical leach, leach field systems in where I live and many parts of the world they're actually putting the water, the dirty water, so toilet water or gray water, back into the so into the ground and into the soil below the topsoil, right? So they're putting it down maybe two meters into the ground, and the topsoil is all in the first meter or two, depending on where you live. Some places have much more topsoil. But typically, you're putting that water down and just relying on mechanical filtration of the sand and the rocks and the substrate of the soil, right? So the whole idea that we're trying to move towards is really taking that gray water and incorporating it into the topsoil. Because all these microbes and different life forms that can really transform and clean up that water and make it available to the plants as fertilizer or phosphorus or different things that it needs, right, before it's actually leaching down into just the substrate. So this is again, this is pictures of this, this system is about one third black water, one third gray water, and one third rainwater harvesting in this system. So, and then on very drought years, like two years ago, we had two and three years ago, we had two of our driest years on record back to back. So in those years, this garden needed about 20% well water, but it's fully, like there's blackberries, currants, apples, nanking cherries, bush cherries, kiwis. This is all in an area that gets 30 centimeters a year. And also just think about like how, if we just use, use our design methods a little bit, right? So I'm at 30 centimeters a year. London's at 65, I think on average, something like that. So if I could take 2,000 square feet of roof catchment and incorporate that, or, two th or say whatever, 200 meters square, 2,000 is like what, 185 meters square, or something like that. So 185 meters square of roof catchment into that same area of landscaping, I'm basically incorporating, I'm changing that landscaping into, ha or that food forest into having the same amount of water as London, right? So really being very intensive and thinking knowledgeable and, and thinking about what types of plants <coughs> am I going to use? What are the appropriate plants that are gonna use the right amount of water in the situation that are gonna meet my needs? And then being very intensive about how, how I use those in each situation, okay? Again, we talked about soil, so I can't say enough about soil. Building compost, cre creating organic <coughs> matter, you know, and Marcia mentioned that too, that's another way to really incorporate that, keeping that water. So if I can cut plants that are containing water, I don't need to water my compost pile as much. If I can incorporate them into the compost pile, that water is being used to support life in the compost pile, which incorporates that organic matter back to the soil, which helps the soil build, hold more nutrients, hold more water, right? So soil is very important. This is actually putting on um, similar to like an Elaine Ingram compost tea application. So that's, again, between, you know, the active catchment, then the passive catchment in the soil, building the organic matter, and then increasing the life forms, the availability of the water to then the plants. You know, so diversifying the life forms in the soil by compost tea, by mulching, you know, keeping some shade on that soil. All of those different techniques can really help us. So this is again another, so I have a, a installation and design business. So this is a client's house. These are mostly all clients' places. 
Um, so again, this is just a little little backyard. Most of her land is very native and xeric and drought tolerant. And this is her little lush oasis garden in the back. Of peaches, apples, plums, right? vegetables, raspberries. And then thinking about phytoremediation off, off parking lots, choosing the appropriate plants to really filter that um, those hydrocarbons and different materials off the sidewalks. These are all different different examples of doing that, what we call like rain gardens or uh, harvesting water off of parking lots and infiltrating them instead of letting them become ish, um, sources of erosion, but infiltrating and then picking the appropriate plants to filter that water as it's being so soaking into the soil, right? Absorbing into the soil. These are all different examples of that. So here's a before and after, with just a couple months after, starting to get going here. So here's some different plant species that we use in the Southwest for filtering different things like hydrocarbons, copper lead, um, arsenic, so picking the right types of plants and then the appropriate location for those plants depending on the situation. Oh, that was in there twice. So we talked about gray water. This is. For the gray water system before was very high tech of using oxygen and pumps and all kinds of things, you know, to use the black water, gray water. This is about as low tech as you can get. Right? <laughs> this is a project in Mexico where she's got a beer bottle in her hand right here. She's making a little trench. So instead of the gray water just oozing out and becoming a puddle right next to the kitchen that's like full of flies and a mess. Just actually directing the water to useful plants that can absorb that water and use the nutrients, right? So moving this out to a, a banana circle, right? So this doesn't have to be, com this isn't complicated stuff, right? Mulch, move the water to where the plants are. <laughs> Pretty simple stuff. So again, these are more just pictures of, of black water, rainwater harvested, gray water um, landscape. So ground cover, strawberries, um, almond tree there. So kind of a before and after of a little hoop house there. So again, thinking of like, okay, I'm not gonna use my black water, gray water on fresh vegetables, right? So I'm gonna use those to grow the trees and the shrubs. I'm gonna use the rainwater to grow things that I might not cook or things that are fresh eaten, right? So again, here's a few more, few more photos of, basically this is, you know, a, a food forest at 30 centimeters a year. One minute. All right, and that's it. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there it is. That's the last one. <laughs> It's like it wasn't going to come up. So this is why we do this, right? Right? We want to be healthy. We want to have. We want to have a secure future. We want healthy children, right? We want clean food, clean water, shelter, happy, healthy children, right? And so I feel like we can do that even in uncertain times that are coming in the future, right? And so we don't always need to hear the doom and gloom. We also need to hear like, okay, how do we? How are we going to do this? Right? So thanks for your attention. Well, thank you for an inspiring talk with bags and bags or ponds and ponds full of optimism. <laughs> um, now, I'm sure there are lots of questions. So again, remember the one breath principle. Um, and I'll cut. let's see, there was a hand back there. The lady in that row. Yeah. Um, I'm living in California in the US right now, big drought country. And uh, I'm wondering about policy making because we are not allowed to use compost toilets or do any water recycling or water harvesting. So I'm wondering uh, <laughs> if yes, uh, corporations <laughs> own any water that falls from the sky to be used for their purposes. So uh, <laughs> I know this, is <laughs> uh, this is true. <laughs> so I'm just wondering in New Mexico, do you have, did you achieve the possibilities that you had through policy making, or did you just have the good luck that they hadn't gotten to that place yet? 
<laughs> well, so no, in New Mexico, it's illegal to install a gray water system without a permit if it's under um, 300 gallons a day. And so um, that's most systems, unless you're getting into a restaurant or a large situation. So, so that, was, that was from policy work and, and passing, you know, being active. Um, there's several people in, in our community that are more active in political ac action than I am that have really helped push that through. Um, and I think, I thought in California, maybe it's municipalities have different ways, but I, I thought that gray water was, was legal in most areas, Margie, isn't that true? Or, and For so, laundry, you can use gray water, and in, at least in the area where I have been. Right, so I think probably different laundry counties laundry. maybe have different rules than the state or something. But, um, and I thought that you could do rainwater harvesting also, if not into tanks, so then just harvest it in the soil. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like what they can't say, like, oh, you can't have a depression here. Right, <laughs> or that your landscape can't be lower than the sidewalk. You know, I mean, that's one way that yeah, the same thing in Colorado because that's the Colorado water is sold to half the United States, and so they're, they're very particular about their water harvesting. So we've been working with them, trying to get. And where I live, it's actually mandatory. So if you build a house over twenty five hundred square feet, you have to put in a rainwater harvesting yeah. system. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a critical situation. Right. So we need large scale solutions and policy making. I think is going to be. Yeah, and so and I don't know if that really came across in in the talk, but it was like mostly I talked about your individual actions, but really the community solution is is changing policy, and also thinking about how your neighborhood. So you have your house, your lot, but then what's your neighbor doing? Is all the, his water draining off? Is it coming out of yours? So getting involved in your community. And then thinking about all of the water on the street, where is that water going? How can we infiltrate that into the local park and create, you know, a collective food forest? So getting really that community. So that's that neighborhood, but then thinking on the citywide and watershed wide scale. So that's something I didn't really cover. Well, that's in the middle. I wondered if New Mexico had begun to reintroduce um, beaver into the landscape as they were the dam builders. Is that happening at all? It is, yeah. They're they're reintroducing them, and a lot of them they're just popping up, and they don't know where they even came from. So, <laughs> uh, there's like gorilla, like gorilla horror, you know, people and taking beavers to little <laughs> little rivers all over. But no, they are on a comeback, and that's that is actually helping a lot. Yeah, and there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of good work, both in the state forestry and and game and fish, and everything is slowly shifting. That's what's really great about groups like this is like we are on the cutting edge it feels like this is so slow and it's like such a slog you know this community this what we're trying to achieve and push forward but this is only going to go this direction we have to i mean like the speak speakers this morning it's like we are going to be forced to move in this direction and so if we can work out all the kinks and, and <coughs> open the way for the rest of humanity to see you know this needs to become the mainstream, and it will be. You know. Well, in California, too, and where we're from, it's uh, stage three going on stage four drought emergency, and the policy is changing rapidly. So a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Yeah, exactly. Use it for your, um, mm -hmm. for your influencing. Right, exactly. It's the moment. Okay, Jay's been Just a, a quick one. Um, you mentioned one of your clients or neighbors that lost their well, the water from the well. I'm just wondering, why they lost the water? Was there a change in agricultural sort of uh, techniques uh, in their area? Why? Why did the well disappear? Well, it was always a real slow-producing well, and then we had we've been having lots of drought over the last twenty years or so, and then we had the two driest years back to back, and so basically, you know, instead of like one gallon a minute, it was like two gallons a day, kind of thing. So. It was really having to be like, okay, are we gonna like sell, the front, like move, or are we going to rethink how we, how we deal with our water situation? So, yeah, most places the water table is still dropping. So, because of all of those, the first few slides. <laughs> okay, there's a question back here. Uh, I'm from Michigan. We have more water than anywhere on earth. <laughs> so, no legislation there. But my question is, uh, where you live. Uh, how much land is required 
uh, to provide all the fruits and vegetables for one family to make themselves a kitchen? Well, it, it, well, it depends. Like I mean, yeah, it really depends. It depends on the eating habits, the types of things you're growing, how, what the soil's like, you know? So it really, I think, um, Jim, John Jevons, or one of the one of the those intensive gardener people, had kind of worked out like how many square feet or how many square meters you needed to uh, supply food for, like each person for a whole year. You know, like this, even these last few slides. I mean, this isn't the sole person's like. You know, they're obviously buying other food also because things are not always in season, or we have, you know, we get you know negative 30 Fahrenheit, you know. So it gets very cold in the winter. Um, not that's extreme, but we can get that cold. You know, we'll definitely get like, you know, negative 20 Celsius, negative 30 Celsius at times. So, um, so there's like, you're storing food for the winter, you're drying food, you know, all, t all different types. To answer your question, I mean, you would need at least probably eight to 10,000, I would think, square feet. Depends if you're doing perennial crops, like food forest crops, or if you're doing intensive vegetable crops. So like John Jeevan's like, he's talking about vegetable crops and like how much we need for, you know, intensive, you know, triple, double, triple bed, you know, dug. Where we're in permaculture, we're really focusing more on perennial crops and ground covers. And so then they are less intensive with water and fertilizer input, but then less, maybe less productive in just actual commodity, you know, materials coming out of them. So, you know, for us, they're doing other things by providing habitat. And, and so I guess that didn't really answer your question, but. Okay, there's a question down here from the radio floor. Uh, yeah, you talk for the black water and toilet waste going directly into the soil, uh, which freak, freak some people out. But I wondered if you've got experience of refed systems where the toilet waste goes into the watery refed and eventually comes back clean. Have you got any of those at all? Yeah, we, we installed those for probably 10 years or so. The hard part is that you evaporate quite a bit out of them. Yeah. And so, and also they still need to go into a leach field afterwards by state law for New Mexico. So what we've reverted to is actually, we do a treatment system. So like at my house, all of my wastewater is reused and growing productive crops. So even the toilet water, and what we do is we change the septic tank from an anaerobic system to an aerobic system. So we're actually pumping oxygen into like an aquarium tank pump, pumping oxygen into the tank, and then you incorporate um, beneficial microbes that actually convert the waste into usable fertilizer for the plants. And then you filter it one more time and actually run it through a drip system for the plant. So it's all subgrade, so you don't want to be spraying gray water or just below the soil. So it's all um, subsoil irrigation through drip lines. And so, um, so again, we would use that for our trees and shrubs and perennial crops. And for our vegetable crops, we would be using the rainwater. Well, thank you very much, Jeremiah. That's thank a very you. Much. Last question on reed beds is a very appropriate lead-in yeah. to um, Jay Abrahams, our final speaker, who is going to be speaking about um, water treatment systems. Well, not just in, water treatment. Well, and other things. Um, and uh, you just give me a minute. I stopped I'll get doing yours. reed beds 25 years ago. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Well, water treatment systems. Yeah. yeah. So. I hope I'll show you why. Stand up, turn yeah, yeah. Yes. Have a little stretch. Okay. So now, why isn't it coming up with a slideshow thing? Um, you are right. You winning? Quite sure why it's not coming up with an option for a slideshow. View maybe? Yes, no, I just tried that. Um, 
just to get some more. Anyone know how to run this thing? <laughs> right. Um, this thing. Help. Let's see if that one looks the top thing. Yes. This one's no. There's a drop down box. There's a drop down box right there. You see it for page. Oh, that one. Okay. Just try it. Or fit page. Or best fit. I think that's only for within that though. What it normally has is the slideshow option at the top, yes, but it doesn't have it. That's, I've tried that already. And the presentation one is the screen. Ah, oh, presentation. Ah, hey. oh, no, great. Thank you very much. Right. Yes. Is okay. everyone stretched and ready? Yes. I'll leave you to it. Okay. How do I do this? Oh, um, it's just the arrows there. Okay, that one there. Very primitive. Could you shut that door? Yes. Okay. Um, my name's Jay Abrahams. I've run biologic design, my permaculture design business now for 23, 24 years. Um, I started out as a microbiologist doing conventional wastewater treatment using machines, lots of energy, lots of waste actually produced by the waste treatment systems. And after a few years of that, I read Bill Mollison's book, Permaculture Designer's Manual, which I can't recommend highly enough to everybody who wants to actually do permaculture design. And that was the end of my career, because I couldn't do these energy-intensive, wasteful systems anymore. Uh, having read Bill's book, um, I heard about swales. There it is. We have a copy. Well done. <laughs> And um, in fact, just as an aside, I'm doing a little bit of research on my own. How many people here have read that book? Excellent. That's, that's, that's actually more than normal. But I recommend, I'd really like to see 100% people reading that book and then applying its principles because that is the way forwards. I really believe that. So, uh, that one there. We were talking earlier, Jeremiah was talking about how we design in dysfunction into our landscapes. Yeah, looking at LA with the huge rain channels taking all that lovely water and just pissing it into the sea instead of harvesting it. So what I do through biologic design is create functional landscapes. Most man-made landscapes are in fact dysfunctional. They need huge amounts of energy to function whereas the, fun the landscapes that I design and create are actually powered by the sun and by gravity. I'm starting a PhD in January uh, based on getting the term low entropy systems design inculcated into the sort of ac academic world. Uh, that's what I say. Our census return, they said, what was your... Um, what was your uh, job? And I said, I'm a low entropy systems designer. <laughs> I thought that will put the cat amongst the pigeons. <laughs> now, entropy is simply energy that can no longer be used for useful work. So that's, it's, it's a, you know, it has various different meanings in different um, uh, sort of uh, fields, but I use the one that it can no longer be used for useful work. The systems I design and create uh, are based on animals, plants, microbes, sunshine. There's no non-renewable energy there at all. So they're low entropy systems. And uh, as was said by Leonardo, my mate, water is the driving force of all nature. So without water, we have no life, we have no biological activity, very little, no productive capacity. What we have is dust and rock. And that is where we're going at the moment. And everything I do is to try and spread that water that just pisses away into the sea, into the landscape to make water, the water cycle, do its duty, which is to be productive, creative, not erosive and destructive. 
So the water cycle gives us our water purification and our biomass production. And all of my work is based on Bill Mollison's book, The Designer's Manual, Permaculture Design Principles, very, very important, and also P.A. Yeoman's key line system. And something else I haven't mentioned here is P.A. Yeoman's scale of permanence in the landscape, which is incredibly important for any site if you want it to be sustainable and regenerative. And I will go into that if I have time later, because I'm using that now to design water systems for whole villages. So swales, I think everyone knows what a swale is. A conventional dryland swale is simply a ditch and a bank on a contour that harvests that rainwater, that runoff water, and lets it infiltrate into the soil where you planted that swale with loads of trees so that the roots are actually enabling that water to go deep into the soil where it can't be evaporated and it's, use, it's there to do some useful work. And a swale is only a swale if it is planted. That's a really important thing. I mean, it's great to do the earthworks, but you need to put the plants in. This was a conventional system done by P.A. Yeomans on his farm, a whole series of acres, hundreds of acres of swale, ponds, um, reservoirs, which drought-proofed his farm through, say, seven years of drought. He still had water on his farm. And that's using the traditional, conventional dryland infiltration swale. Now... From my work with the conventional wastewater treatment industry and my <coughs> disaffection, shall we say, with reed beds, about 25 years ago I did two very large reed beds and for my company I was working for. Uh, and I was over the moon. I was this is great. I'm doing, you know, using plants to purify water. And one was a five acre reed bed, which is two hectares, and one was a, a seven acre reed bed. So big. And after a couple of weeks of working on the first one and seeing these 40-tonne trucks drive up with gravel, dump it into these concrete line trip uh, containers, these reed bed containers, and the miles and miles of distribution and oxygenation pipework, plastic pipework, I realised <coughs> that what I believed to be a really green and groovy way forwards was actually very, very high embodied energy and not ecological at all, on that scale at least. And I had a great moment, I suppose, of cognitive dissonance that something I'd really believed in wasn't real. Luckily, I'd read Bill Mollison and his book, Permaculture Designer's Manual, <laughs> which I'd like you all to read and apply. <laughs> and I knew about swales, and I thought, OK, what if we took these swales, and instead of harvesting rainwater, we harvested wastewater? And what if, we, instead of using all this gravel, we used soil as a purification medium? And what if we used not just one species like we do in the reed bed of reeds, Phragmites, but we used a whole plethora of wetland plants and trees, reeds, rushes, sedges, willow trees, all the trees, all these things. And we didn't say this is a, a way of getting rid of stuff, but actually it's a way of harvesting these lovely nutrients and harvesting this, this water. What if we made a system like that? And then I did a permaculture design course with Patrick Whitefield, and he said to me, we said to the whole group, he said, what can you people do now after you've had this two-week intensive permaculture and you're on this permaculture high, you can change the world, you believe you can do anything, what can you, each and every one of you, do right now using permaculture design principles and your own knowledge base and interests to earn a living right now? And it was like one of those moments I thought, I'm going to have to do what I've been trying to do through these other companies. I'm going to have to set up my own company and do wetland ecosystem treatment, which is swale-based wastewater purification, resource production, and habitat creation. Now, the difference between a conventional swale and a wet system swale is that we compact the swale ditch so that it doesn't infiltrate. We don't want that wastewater infiltrating into the subsoil. We want it to stay in the topsoil where all those lovely roots are. And of course, on the roots are all those lovely microbes. I mentioned I'm a microbiologist by training, so I see the world in terms of microbes. Mm -hmm. So this is what we do. This is a farm-based system. It's dealing with the wastewater from 350 dairy cattle, the silage liquor runoff, and the mud, oh, sorry, the, the liquor coming off the, the, the yards, not the solids, but all the liquid waste. 
It's a six acre system and in this final pond there are fish and that's one of the yields. There are 35,000 willow trees which can be coppiced and then they grow back so it's a renewable resource. They can be chipped and used as bedding for the animals or as a fuel. There are five and a half thousand other coppiceable trees. If I say anything you don't understand like coppiceable and stuff like that, do put your hand up. I, I like questions. So a coppice, is this coppice? Coppice tree, like a willow, is a tree that grows up. It can be cut down each year and then it grows up again and it can be cut down each year and that provides renewable resources. All the trees, for example, can be cut down every seven years in the same, same way and sweet chestnut every, say, 14 years, hazel every seven years. So some of our trees are coppiceable trees. So they give us a yield time and time again, even though we've cut them down, it's pretty drastic. So we use a lot of coppice trees in our work. So there are also bees on this site. There are hives, bees. So there's honey, there's fish. There are deer come through here and he's got a high seat and he shoots the deer and gets venison. There are pheasants in this because he rents part of the system to a pheasant shoot. So these are things that he's earning money from this waste water. And one of the loveliest things, I think, I don't even know about uh, farmers being ripped off by the supermarkets for milk. Well, he's a milk producer and every time he speaks to Tesco's, he gets really angry because they've just lowered the price again. He said, Jay, when I like that, I go into the wet system and I sit amongst the trees in the dappled shade and look at the dragonflies and the birds and it's good for my soul. Mm -hmm. So that's another yield. Yeah. Awesome. So a wet system is a, a horizontal plug flow soil. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Just a question. Can you eat the fish? Yes. Uh, there in the waste yes. Water? No, no, that's pure water, that's bathing quality water. All of our systems, we have bathing quality water in the bottom ponds. Okay, so the fish are in the bottom ponds? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, yeah, just put your hand up and wave. It's good. <laughs> I know you're awake then. So, uh, a wet system is a horizontal plug flow, soil mycorrhizal, multi species purification and production system. That's the, the technical definition. Plug okay, plug flow. All right. Um, well, it's horizontal because it's, it's actually on the contour, so it's actually running along. It's not vertical. Uh, it's a plug flow because it's designed so that, say, you have a cubic metre of wastewater coming in a day, then it's designed with no mixing, no heating, no energy inputs. The water comes in and sits there. And then the next day, another cubic metre comes in, another plug so to speak, of water comes in, and it moves the first plug along a bit, and then the next one comes in. So that's plug flow. The joy of plug flow is that if you know how long your water takes to be purified within the system, and you size it right, you know that by the time a bit of water from point A at the inlet has reached all the other points and gone all the way along and it's reached point Z at the end, you know it's bathing quality water, because you're not mixing it all up. So you know it's taken this journey of time through all those roots, all the way to the final ponds. Uh, just as an aside, I do a day with the uh, Shift Bristol group uh, once a year, and it's become a tradition now that they swim in the final pond of a farm mm -hmm. wastewater treatment system that we go and do the day on. Mm -hmm. uh, so to prove it, it's bathing quality. We haven't lost anyone yet. <laughs> it depends on the wastewater. It depends on a lot of very site-specific uh, factors. I, it's a soil-based system, so you can imagine if a soil's that deep, it's very different to if the soil's that deep or non-existent. Or if you've got rock, or if you've got deep subsoil, each system has to be site-specific. So it, it, if you have a specific question about a specific site, I can be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, everyone all right on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we use the metabolic processes of the microbial species living on the root zone of all the plants. It's not the plants that are doing the purification. The plants are backing up and living in symbiosis with the microbes on the roots. And the microbes are saying thank you to the plants for supplying oxygen and sugars from photosynthesis, and they're mineralizing the waste water and providing those nutrients in a utilizable, biologically uh, absorbable way to the plant. So it's this lovely symbiosis between the plants and the microbes within the systems we do. Yeah. So in the reed system, uh -huh. the, the idea is that actually the water evaporates. That's what the reeds do. 
do you also have the... Yeah, we have a, a, an immense evapotranspiration potential within a wet system. Oh, okay. Yeah. But in the real wet system, you also have the uh, micro... Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's based on gravel. I like to say that reed beds are very 20th century and it was a really nice path, you know, with reed beds between the conventional systems, reed beds to 21st century, which is wet systems. I, that's what I like. That's my marketing department likes to say that. <laughs> but I, I look at uh, reed beds as a chemical engineer's idea about a natural, what a, a natural wastewater treatment system should be. Because it's, it's basically a container, known volume, <coughs> gravel, known void space, you know, roots, oh, and that's it. It's really a trickling filter with some reeds growing in it. Okay. Soil, you've got much, much smaller particle size, much, much greater uh, <coughs> potential for microbes to live there. And so, again, I'm you know, blowing my own trumpet, but reed, uh, reed beds are not as efficient as wet systems, and also they tend to block up. And then they have to be dug up and replanted every 10, 15 years. So the other thing with a wet system as opposed to most other waste treatment systems is they sequester carbon dioxide. Uh, if you can imagine, if you've got a powered system, it's actually creating carbon dioxide because the electricity has to be produced from something. And in the past 23 years, uh, Biologic Design has planted between 5,000 and 100,000 trees every year on our systems. We don't use gravel and we don't use large quantities of pipe work. And again, the wet system views the wastewater don't really like the term, as a resource to be used, not as a problem to be got rid of. It's a, just turning that problem on its head. But as Bill Mollison says in his book, Probably Permaculture the Designer's Manual, he said, within every problem is the seed of the solution to that problem. So there's some yields that we get from wet systems. There's a, I mean, again, as Bill Mollison says in his book, um, the, the, uh, the yield from any system is limited only by the imagination of the designer. So this is some of our willow. We've got 60-odd different varieties of basketry willow now. It's all different colours. This is some of the stuff that's made from... Uh, it's cheese waste being processed in this wet system that's producing this willow. Uh, this is the Western site, which is uh, an eight-acre system. Uh, it was the second job I did when I set up Biologic Design, so I was really thrown in at the deep end. This one has a BOD. The waste has a BOD, a biological oxygen demand, which is if you like, the amount of oxygen required to purify it, a BOD of 350 is what sewage is. That's 350 milligrams uh, of oxygen per litre of sewage. This has a BOD of 10,000. Um, also, it's got a pH of 3.5, which is not quite battery acid, but it's getting there. <laughs> Here we've got 55,000 willow trees, tens of thousands of water plants, and if we zone down from this overview... Oh, the other thing is... It used to be a total absorption system 23 years ago, but they now make 200 times more cider than they did then. 200 times, not 200%, 200 times more cider. So we've built the buns up, we've created more swales, we used a lot of wood chip to build up the banks and the buns. But stuff that used to be, a, say, half a metre above top water level is now about two metres below top water level. So the whole thing has had to grow with the company, but that's possible. Where, where is this, you said? This is in Herefordshire. And where does the water go at the end? Ah, good question. The only pump on this whole system is in that end bit there, and that now irrigates 200 acres of apple orchard, thereby increasing the apple yields by about a tonne and a half per acre per year, which means more cider, which means more waste, which <laughs> around we go. So nothing is wasted in a wet system. Did you say how many trees per acre? It, it, it's not per acre because they're on the swales, but there are 55,000 trees on this site. So eight-acre site. Eight uh, eight. That was an eight-acre site. Yes. But we've got quite large ponds. Yeah. We need to hold it. It's now classified as a reservoir, which is a whole new ball game. So from there, we zoom down to the ground, and this is what the trees are looking like now after 20 years. Just imagine the evapotranspiration potential of a stick like this big with no roots and no, you know, nothing. And then 23 years later, you've got this tree and think of the evaporation, of the tra evapotranspiration potential and also the root zone. Think of the size of the root zone. So the wet system actually gets better with time rather than with a reed bed clogging up. 
and with conventional machines breaking down, wet systems get better with time, believe me. It's the marketing department again. This is a swale, so we're standing in the swale ditch full of reeds and we're looking at a swale bank full of trees and the water is passing away into the wall through the soil bank. That's how it works. Um, it's bioengineering, not your you know, molecular genetic bioengineering. This is biological engineering using microbial and plant species to carry out engineering functions. And those engineering functions for my business is wastewater purification, odour control and soil stabilisation. This one is our odour control for sewage, it's Glyceria maxima, has a brilliant habit, it grows up, flops over and each root, each node, leaf node, sends out a shoot and a root. So if you've got a, potentially a pool of smelly water, you want to cover it. And this stuff is really good for sewage, it loves sewage far more than Phragmites love sewage. I mean, I've just noticed Phragmites actually moving away from sewage and it grows that way. This stuff just dives in. And as it flops over and sends roots and shoots, it creates what we call a reed raft over the surface and that stops any odours. Uh, Glyceria maxima. The only thing with this is it doesn't like acidic conditions. You use this in, say, cider waste, and within 24 hours it's dissolved into a green sludge. So we use the next, I'll show you the next one we use for the reed rafts on acidic waste is, is the next one. Not this one. This is um, soil stabilising. This is <coughs> Eupatorum cannabinum, um, hemp agrimony, which we spread as seed on fresh earthworks and it binds, it has this amazing root zone which just binds everything together really quickly and stops it being eroded. This is the one, this is greater <coughs> wi willow herb. We use this on acidic wastes for the reed raft floats on top. Again, we put seed onto a, a, a floating raft of straw and this stuff grows and stops odours. And this we, we use, it's a water fig work, it's a nectar source, brings in the birds to get the, in, so it brings in the insects which brings in the birds and as Jeremiah said, you know, the birds are our messengers and they're bringing us nutrients and just as a little an aside, I had a whole bunch of environment agency people visiting Westerns and they were looking at this lushness and they were saying but how is this possible, this lushness, when you have a nutrient-depleted waste? There's no nitrogen and very little phosphorus in cider waste. So I'm saying, well, it's the alder trees we've planted. What? Well, they're nitrogen-fixing trees, and they're putting the nitrogen right in the root zone where the bugs need it. Yeah, but what about the phosphate? I said, well, that's the birds. What do you mean, the birds? I said, well, they poo. They come in and they poo, and that's rich in phosphate. And they finally twigged. That's how we do it. We bring in all the things that make a whole ecosystem, mm. and then it works really well. Yes, sir. Um, can, can you explain to me, is there a point in your design where your clients can perceive you get your feedback? Can what? Uh, is there a point when you do a design where you can plan, whether it's in five years or 20 years, that your clients will get your feedback? Payback. Payback. Feedback. Feedback. No, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I find, I find that it's a good tool to um, measure how, uh, how much resources you're saving. Uh-huh. Uh, that, you know, you can tell your clients, well, this is my fee, and it's my fee because I do good work. Yeah. But then it's going to be saving so much resources that in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, yeah. you're actually, I mean, it's going to balance out. Oh, payback. 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 Yeah. Payback. Um, well, Several of our sites, in fact, if we go on a little bit further, you'll see a couple of sites that have actually paid for themselves by selling the willow over the time they've been there. So, yeah, and at Westerns, we've probably saved them about a conservative estimate, about a million pounds a year in wastewater treatment charges. So wow. I wish, I really wish, that on the outset I'd had in the thing, if I can have half a percent of all money saved, <laughs> I'd be a very happy man. But I didn't, but anyway... So I just this is one day next uh, at Western side, walking round. These are my willing workers, the microorganisms, and it's the fruiting bodies. So you, what happens, I'll say this, what you see on a wet system, you see all the lush growth and the plant, you don't see the business side of things. You don't see the microbes. You don't see the mycorrhiza because they're all in the soil. But they're doing the business. And when they mate, these mycorrhizal fungi, they form fruiting bodies. So this was one day, a little walk around Westerns, these are the fruiting bodies I saw that day, just as an indication of what's going on below the surface. It's a slime mould, 
bracket fungus and other slime mold. Yeah, that's good. Just all different sorts, and they're all there all the time doing their thing. No pay, no holidays. <laughs> this this system here is for up to 50, it's a campsite in Herefordshire. Up to 1,500 people can be there for a week. Then sometimes there's nobody there and sometimes it's 50 people for a weekend. So it has a lot of different inputs and that's another thing with reed beds, they don't like variable inputs. Wet systems can handle that. So this is uh, a site that's paid for itself probably two or three times over simply by selling the willow to a basket maker. It's about 15, 16 years old now. And this is a summer shot, and that's a winter shot. So you can see where the willow clumps of willow are. So it looks good in summer, and it looks pretty good in winter too. So it's a cider farm. Um, we started August the 20th, 2007. I do use some rather large equipment, but as Bill Mollison says in his book, it's all, it's all right to burn a little oil as long as you're creating systems that will last for decades or centuries, doing some earth, earth moving. So here we have really beautiful deep soil, fantastic subsoil, 10 to the minus 11 uh, metres per second uh, percolation, so virtually impermeable. We take the topsoil away and store it. We don't let anyone touch that. That's gold dust for me. Everyone wants to come bring their wheelbarrows. Oh, can I have that for my garden? You stay away. <laughs> so the subsoil is where we cut the form. So here's the swales being made, fairly large swales. So I'm a bit of a swale fan myself following the contour, so you always get a really nice shape because you're following the landform. The landform is informing your design and that's where you start. You start with the landform. That's my little toy. I like doing a bit of work in that, compacting to 7.5 tonnes per square metre to prevent any water, any wastewater going into the ground. So this is the swales being made and we started at the top end because cider making was going to start in four days' time. So we had to actually let the water, the wastewater, into the system before we'd even completed half of the system. There it is, the lovely wastewater, pH 3, BOD 10,000. Lovely. <laughs> so there we go. That was the earthwork seeded, power harrowed, ready to go and ready to be planted. And then about 10 months later, we got this. Yeah, just add water. That's where one of our mottos. So the side farm, May 2009, this is the original lagoon that was feeding our wet system. This has been here for probably 25 years. The wet system was in 2007. What they used to do is take water from here and spread it on the land. They found it was killing the trees that they were growing. They couldn't do it anymore. So they just basically put it in this big pond and then they had nowhere to put it. So for a time, David, the cider maker, was just opening the valve every now and then to let it go into a ditch. And when I got there, there was sewage fungus about 12 feet long in this ditch. And that's a whole other story which I can't go into yet because we don't have time. But it was very close with the Environment Agency saying, let's just have a look in this ditch. Oh, <laughs> sewage fungus. So anyway, I said, well, maybe the valve's leaking. So anyway, it comes from there into the first swale. And these are all acid-tolerant sedge species and willows. So we have to be very careful at this point what species we use. Then we're going down to swale two, swale three, there are six on this site, swale four, swale five. And it's getting bigger, and that actually enhances the plug flow that I'm so keen on. This is uh, the penultimate pond, pond five, pretty good. This is not even a year after we did the initial earthworks, and there's the final pond. So it's a, a radical transformation, and then the ducks move in. So, two years after we started the earthworks, do you remember what those earthworks were like? We've got this. Just add water. So, here we have a village scale system. Population varies between 50 and 200 people with annual events of 2,000. It's actually a, a Buddhist retreat very close to me in Herefordshire. And we're going to start and see the whole process. This was the field when we started. Quite how steep. Big, how big is that field? Uh, well, the field's quite big. We took an acre of it. Yeah. So here come the diggers. And we clear the topsoil again. And we create the swale with the subsoil, which we compact. Actually, sorry, that's within five minutes. Okay, come on. It's not moving. Oh. Come on. 
Wake you up. Mean, take a question, Mark. Yeah, take yeah. a question. I'll just hit the computer. <laughs> it's not okay, moving. There are two questions. Hello, hello. Um, you want to go first? Yeah, so if you've got these big, big spaces to plan, how do you do that? I'll show you in the next few slides. <laughs> I have a really good planting team. It's changed. It has changed. Oh, yeah. It's just very slow. Oh, come on. Go back now. <laughs> next. In that last system, how long did it take the water to move through all six swales? Uh, I go for that. It's really strong wastewater, so I aim for at least a year's retention. At least a year? And yeah. how much water can move through in that one year? I can't remember offhand. Quite a lot. Do you have any estimated <laughs> uh, No, because I can't remember that. There's too, okay. many, too many systems. Um, but they've now doubled their capacity to make cider, as they do, these cider makers. But luckily the wet system still has the capacity because of the trees. <coughs> the trees get 